Hello, and welcome to Think Fit, Be Fit podcast. My name is Jennifer Schwartz. I'm the hostess and creator of this podcast, where we are dedicated to effective thinking for potent exercise. The conversations range from exercise mechanics, movement science, optimal lifestyle design, and even embracing curiosity with exercise, all with the goal in mind to help people develop a deeper connection to exercise and live a fit life without the diluted rules and advice from the fitness industry. This episode is centered around the most frequently asked question that I've received, a question that has been directed to me, which is, how do I train my legs and my butt? And that's because a nice ass never goes out of style. But (laughs) the thing is, I'm in style and I have been for a while. So I'm sharing the underlying secrets and the background behind all this info. Plus, I bring on two of my colleagues who know a lot about this stuff. Uh, Kat Sajak and Ryan Crossfield that's uh, Stay Strong Strength Coach on Instagram and Kat is Kat underscore Sajak underscore AC on Instagram check the show notes for all their stuff So the short answer is that I lift weights with machines and barbells whenever possible. And the long answer is this episode, Lab of Me. I made the commitment to this story and this episode after reviewing the timeline of my own workouts in quarantine and reflecting on the value that a barbell and building muscle holds for me. Truly, it's sacred work for me. I um, am so fortunate to be able to focus on these goals and therefore present it to you guys. So I I hope that you get a lot out of this episode because it is packed with information. I'm really excited to share this stuff with you guys and gals. And thank you so much for being here. It would mean the world to me to learn that you are learning from this episode and from this podcast. And if you don't know how to reach me, You can find me on my new Instagram handle, Jennifer underscore Simone underscore Schwartz. That is my name. I'm going personal with the branding now. Anyways, this episode, like I said, a lab of me. We're talking about my background. You're going to get to know me on a anatomy level. Like, that's exciting. (laughs) Um, You're going to learn how I've been training, my philosophies, my background, and when I decided to start using a coach and using a program. So we're going to feature a class that I take and that I fully endorse, and we're going to talk health optimization and what it means to like really train the glutes and the hamstrings. Like, What do you have to do to improve the look, feel, and performance of that area? Before we get started, I have a few announcements. One is, you may have seen, you may have heard, we have a new website, thinkfitbefitpodcast.com. I'm also hosting a webinar in September for upgrading your home exercise because I'm talking about exercise a lot in strength training and I realize a lot of us don't have access to a barbell machines. Um, So 
I'm out in the webinar world trying to solve this problem where I will walk through different body weight exercises and how to upgrade them. This is free. Don't miss it. it the registration is at movementpathways.com. The third announcement is our new socials just for the podcast, Think Fit Be Fit underscore podcast on Facebook and Instagram. And I'd also encourage you to sign up for our newsletter where we dive deeper on these concepts and enhance exercise from the inside out with knowledge. And in the newsletter, on the socials, and in the podcast, you are going to see some incredible collaborations with the best in the fitness industry. And while these people that I collaborate with don't have huge Instagram followings or sponsorships or whatnot, they are true professionals in the exercise science field and have been either writing publishing or doing and working in the fitness industry for decades, just like myself. So you're going to get a lot of wisdom and knowledge in the content that we are bringing you. And I am so grateful to do that. So thank you so much again for being here and listening to these announcements. Let's get started. This episode has three chunks of content, all centered on that ass, more specifically my ass. And that first part is a monologue about all the stuff that I've been doing for years. And I can't wait to get into it with you guys. The second part is a feature on the class that I am currently attending, which is a socially distanced strength training barbell class in Alexandria, Virginia. I wanted to highlight this amazing boss babe, Kat Sajak, because her philosophy is uh, something I endorse, obviously, and wanted to just share that with you guys and listen to another perspective um, and someone who has studied programming and strength training and, you know, Um, she's, she's got it all. She's (laughs) so I can't wait for you guys to meet her. The third part of this episode is a Q and a with a trainer that has a lot of experience in health optimization, which is the foundation for strong glutes, right? We have to have a body that's good at building muscle and really efficient at it and that we don't break down from it. So I brought on our previous podcast guest, Ryan Crossfield. We Back in March, we talked about, you know, things you could do at home to get healthy during quarantine. Well, it turns out that the things that make you healthy are also the practices and habits that will contribute to a beautiful butt, strong legs, and good performance of those things, meaning functional and feeling good in your body. I hope that's what this is all about, right? (laughs) Um, And to start this, I am, I'm, I'm really pleased to share my philosophies on strength and showing you kind of what's possible because I have really taken a journey against the grain against common wisdom around arthritis and common wisdom around women and their knees. So I wanted to, you know, just start with that, that part of my journey has been finding a new identity uh, around getting strong and getting grounded in a mission to feel good in my body. So my, a phrase that I often use when I'm writing or reminding my clients of all the good things that exercise has or holds for us or the possibilities is that fitness is feeling amazing in your body. That's something I wake up to and think about often. And 
you know, we seem to have forgotten that while running away from the virus, you know, and whether you're literally or figuratively running a lot, you know, more than you, more than normal, I really feel called to share exercises that I use to strengthen my knees and strengthen my body. So I'm taking the opportunity to tell this story through the most frequently asked question I've ever gotten, which is how do you train your glutes and legs? So the background is really important because I'm not going to pretend like I wanted to be some fitness model and aspired to look a certain way. I, I have been aspiring to be stronger than anyone ha- could ever expect me to be. And I have stood in front of hundreds of female athletes with this story because it's important because so many athletes injure their knees and have, you know, a real, a real probability that their knees will age faster. If you had injuries as a youth athlete, a younger athlete, and you had to get surgery, the chances of your joints having arthritis is, you know, really high. They say some, um, in some literature that a knee, a ACL reconstruction can accelerate arthritis by 25 years, meaning arthritis is a very natural process, but surgery accelerates that process. And that's why this message is important. And I hope that, you know, you, some of you may be listening that I've had injuries as a younger athlete or as an athlete in general at any age and know that your body has changed and you feel that your body has changed. I'm here to tell you that you can gain, I'm here to show you that you can gain control over that and write a new narrative. So, and if you are one of those athletes that can identify with me on some level, you've been injured before and you know your body's changed and you want a new narrative, then it's really important to sit in gratitude with the experiences that have gotten us here. How I arrived to this moment is is perfection and I I'm really proud of the decisions I've made around these injuries and uh what you know what I learned from sports even though again it caused some injuries accelerated arthritis I wouldn't give any of it back and I think a lot of people would agree with me but it's just good to acknowledge this gratitude without that gratitude We are just taking small steps and small wins at a time, which is great too, but the gratitude compounds what is possible in my opinion. And so just a quick gratitude hug for all those experiences and struggles that have uh, got me to where I am at and sitting and talking at you right now. So, you know, my background is that my previous knee injuries were the catalyst for my entire career. And I'm 38 now, sitting right here, right now in August 2020. And when I had first come across muscle activation techniques, what I do for a living, I had three knee surgeries before I was 19. And Fast forward through playing soccer and college and many life events, I uh, ended up at a gym working as a personal trainer called the Sports Club LA and found an, a muscle activation technique specialist there. Her name is Ami. I have definitely mentioned her before. And I had worked with her twice, meaning two hours, and I could not believe how much my posture and strength had improved. I felt stronger immediately. At 26 years old, I could feel the agility of a college soccer player. And straight up, I thought I had lost these quote-unquote things with the knee injuries and 
the surgeries, which covers another frequently asked question in my practice podcast and my practice, which is how did you end up doing muscle activation techniques and how long have you been doing it? Well, I started the coursework almost um, just months after those sessions with her because it finally brought a piece that was missing from the fitness industry. Um, If you want to know more about that, please go to muscleactivation.com where you will see my name listed amongst the Full Body RX practitioners. And just a quick shout of gratitude to that organization who really has inspired a very wonderful career. And being able to help people in such a unique way is a gift. So thank you, MAT. And our... So before I had had these sessions, I was truly on a guessing mission as to why my knee would not straighten all the way. So I had less extension in my right knee than my left, and this caused all kinds of weird postural changes and adjustments, and most importantly, it made my exercise and my strength training crappy. I had not, I didn't really didn't have a lot of pain when I was going through this, but I knew my exercise could be better. I knew my gait could be better. I knew my posture could be better and my strength could be better. And that's what I was seeking. I did not want to be a trainer that was injured. And because I knew I, that I love training and I was possibly going to naturopathic school or acupuncture school and that I wanted to stay in the wellness industry. So fast forward, a marriage, divorce, jobs, entrepreneurship. Here we are. My focus is being a great example for female athletes. And at the time I was working with pretty much exclusively female athletes in training, uh, in coaching, and I had a few personal training clients on the side. So this was like a major pivoting time for me about 2000. 10, 11, and uh, 12. So this shaped my entire philosophy on how to get stronger. So that means I am just going to share the things that I've really focused on for this like decade of my life, which is optimal recovery and being wary of bringing in inflammation into my body. So keeping it as clean and healthy as possible. And then strength-wise, concentric and isometric exercise has always been a part of this process for me. And that is one thing that I think has gone against, you know, some of the major recommendations for people who have had knee injuries. So I think it's, you know, that's one of the modest things. One of the things I would say is modest about my approach is that focusing on concentric strength, meaning using resistance to strengthen all parts of the muscle and the movement that I'm trying to target, it's not fancy. It's not, you know, sexy, Instagram sexy. It's really straightforward and Those are just two really straightforward things, um, being optimal in recovery and focusing on strength. And I've always said that, and (laughs) I feel like I have to explain myself. I really got the nice muscle development when I did start incorporating a lot more eccentrics. But the key for me when I'm guiding people through this process is that most people don't have the tolerance for a lot of eccentrics. And that's something Ryan and I bring up. I love talking about that subject. I think it's contra to many fitness um, opinions and expertise. So I just love to talk about that and maybe even challenge some people on this concept that concentric strength uh, and shortening strength and re- the strength that you get from really straightforward resistance training is 
such an important prerequisite to training at a higher volume with eccentric loading like deadlifts. So I know I'm speaking to you right now as if you had a trainer or are a trainer. So, um, you know, I don't really know how to dumb it down anymore, like, or bring it to a more consumer level. It's just like not a bunch of plyometrics and jumping around. It's like exercise and strength training is about healthy joints and stimulating in a very gentle and concise, com- precise way. You know, I look at exercise as dosing and that when we exercise, we are stimulating. So we want to give it the right amount. Anyways. Okay. So I've taken this fitness journey. It's been against the grain. And again, the bigger picture has always been this sovereignty that I could find in strength training. Well, the takeaway, what I think is important is that we seek our own sovereignty in whatever health activity that we're attracted to. And if you're attracted to this podcast, it's going to be getting strong because that is my message. Strong is the new sexy. Strong is the asset that you want the most of in for your body. And I um, could talk about this forever because I have spent thousands and thousands of dollars and hours and thousands of hours on this very goal. So, but at the end of the day, it is consistency. It is, I want to replace the word modest with just effective and smart exercise. This is, this is my story. This is, oh God, I could just really keep going with this. Um, I think the important thing again, um, so I don't run around in circles again, mechanically speaking, I'm at a loss in both of my knees. So I have two torn ACLs. I have this arthritis in both knees. And that strength is so important for me. And that's also the great part of this story is that I focused on getting the strength and covering up for the mechanical deficiencies I have in my knee and achieved the body in the process. And what I am referring to is essentially what celebrities and other people want to inject into their backside, right? Muscle, but you can't buy it. You can't inject it or lift it with a surgery. This is smart, consistent training. And when you consider what's at stake, and what you have to work with, you can make it happen. And that's my, that's my message. That's my hope. So in summary, here's the short answer to the how, what I've been lifting and why. I have relied on machines a lot, barbell more recently than before, But definitely a lot of machines and a lot of um, soccer conditioning that has helped me build this strength. So even before I was using um, a barbell for strength training like I am now, I was using trap bar deadlifts and different types of split squats with uh, all the machines. So in the last two years, I've been consistent with Pilates, which has been great for recovery and mobility, flexibility, and eccentric strength, which is back in the conversation because I wasn't doing a lot of eccentric strength because I was coaching soccer a lot. And I knew that recovery was an issue. So I have built up quite a tolerance and since I don't have to go on the field anymore and since I really value the work and the change that barbell strength training can do, that's why it's so in my program now and I will continue to keep that in my program. And for the ladies listening, 
This is going to get really juicy on this end of the what we do to build the, you know, the desired look and strength of the lower body and the glutes. So our transition to the class that I'm taking at Ascend Strength and Cycle called Lift Lab and the conversation with Ryan about all those juicy details are a list of myths with regards to glute training. Okay, so here are some glute training myths, and I'm not going to take time to explain these. I Maybe we can do that on, a, on an Instagram Live or another episode, but the reason I put this list together is so that if you hear some of these points made in marketing for any fitness program, it's time for you to run away from that program or question it on a deeper level. So here are the myths that I wanted to share with you guys. There is no optimal exercise to build muscle. Glutes are fast twitch muscles that should be trained with heavy weights. That's not necessarily true all the time. And it's uh, it's more true than doing a thousand repetitions or doing a Stairmaster for 45 minutes a day. But I just think it's it, it should not be an absolute that glutes are fast twitch muscles. I um, can't get on board with that for everyone. Next myth, you must squat deep. That's wrong. Some of us are just, we just aren't built for it. And we have to work the mobility and the tolerance in our muscles and other areas uh, before attempting to squat deeper. So just squatting deeper is not going to do this. It has more to do with consistency and tempo and recovery than anything else. You, um, You have to be super sore to build muscle. Also not true. Okay, toning. Ladies. This isn't a real thing. Please stop relying on that when um, you see it in the marketing or you hear trainers talking about it. Toning doesn't, is not a a real thing. So uh, trainers, if you're listening, please stop using that term. Your, oh, here's a one that I hear all the time. Your glutes aren't firing. No, no, no. This was built on the all or none principle. And I can't tell you in this episode how many ways this is wrong. If you don't have proper training or neuromuscular coordination, this deficiency coupled with weakness could diminish a muscle's contribution to an exercise for which it is intended. But under no no circumstance will a muscle, quote unquote, stop firing. There's different degrees of muscle activity and responsiveness. That's different. Um, That's much more specific than saying your glutes aren't firing. And yeah, so I'm leaving that one there. Our next one, just because someone has a nice butt doesn't mean they can teach you. The, like your resume for a trainer shouldn't be how you look. It should be part of the content of the resume of how good you are as a trainer, but it not it should not be the only thing on your resume. Uh, okay, and that obviously could get some attention from <laughs> um, my anger. I uh, here's another one: tight hip flexors and weak glutes. That conversation is just a blame game, guys. So when you hear you have tight f- hip flexors and weak glutes. I think that's a blame game, blame game for not understanding muscle or joint structure. I, um, and then here's my last one, which you'll definitely hear in strength and conditioning. Quad dominance is the reason why you need to strengthen your hamstrings and your glutes. No, that is so silly because we are all quad dominant. Uh, the rectus femoris is one of the strongest muscles in the body And I hope it's dominant because it's that strong. So many exercises should be quad dominant, especially the standing ones. So I really hate that term, even though it came from a good place. And 
<laughs> has helped people strengthen their hamstrings, I, I still think it needs to die and we need to break up with it. Okay, those that's my list of glute myths that I wanted to share before diving in um, into this next layer of the episode. Okay, the next uh, layer, here we go. I really am excited to feature Kat Sajak on this podcast because it's someone I admire in business and really in friendship. I, you know, we've watched each other grow as business ladies and I'm so impressed with this programming and this format. I had to give it up and have her featured and hopefully on a future episode where I'm sure really fun conversations will be sparked. You can follow her uh, at katsajak.com. Um, her wonderful studio is called Ascend Cycle. She has exercise science a degree from George Washington University, and she has opened this boutique cycling studio after spending a decade in the corporate world. And her exercise science background is just a small part of what she does. She's really well-rounded. And in fact, her mission is helping people find that balance to be a badass, to be strong, to be a mom. She even has chickens. (laughs) And um, to show up and, you know, be a leader I just admire all of these things about her. So let me give you her socials. She is on Instagram, of course, at cat underscore sajak underscore ac. Her last name is Z-A-J-A-C, and that is also her website, catsajak.com. And then we have Ascend Cycle and Ascend Strength, both on Instagram and the World Wide Web. Uh, They have virtual classes, so I would totally check them out. I have not, uh, but obviously it might be a good idea based on this review. (laughs) She also does some programming, and that would be for strength training, which, you know, I I mentioned before, like I I did most of my journey of the strength by myself, and I I really didn't seek help for the strength training piece until about three years ago. And before that, I was either working with a medical professional on my nutrition or a muscle activation technique specialist for my recovery and for injury prevention. And who knows what else? I'm so done talking. Uh, (laughs) Monologue. Sorry. As soon as I said that, my voice like gave out. That's hilarious. And probably a sign that it's time for someone else to talk. Um, Anyways, obviously, I encourage you guys to join in on the fun and join us virtually or or maybe in person. Hey, maybe my clients are listening and they're ready to pump it up with me. That would be amazing because there is really only four spots in these classes and you get personalized attention and there have been all abilities throughout my several weeks going there and it is safe and socially distanced and even has some fresh air. In fact, they moved their whole entire cycle operation to a old car garage uh, and I always knew it would be a good gym. So I just got to follow these intuitions because I've been staring at that garage for a while because Kat and I are neighbors, essentially, in business. And yeah, as soon as they announced it, I was commenting on Instagram that, yeah, of course, that's going to be an amazing spot for cycling in its open air. And I just, you know, can't wait uh, to go again, which is actually tomorrow morning. (laughs) So basically, I asked her these two questions to help give us this picture of, you know, why I'm going there and why I'm aligned to this type of strength training. So I asked her, why did you create Lift Lab and why is the emphasis on strength training? 
And what is your favorite exercise of the strength exercises in class? The intention behind the Lift Lab was for me to take the strength and conditioning programming that I would typically prescribe for my personal training clients and apply it in the small group setting. My hope is that the Lift Lab can show the fitness community that strength training is an absolute necessity if you want to achieve results. So those results that people are looking for, in my experience, is that people exercise for aesthetic reasons. They want to look good and they also want to maintain their health. And the average person is not a bodybuilder. We're not athletes. Typically, we're not fitness models, yet these are the images of what most of us see in marketing for fitness products and brands. And that results in a, what I believe is a skewed perception on what types of exercise is actually effective in getting results. If you want to look good, what do you do? So for this reason, I find that women especially are shying away from weight training in favor of cardio and higher rep, high intensity workouts. So I kind of call this the chasing of the calorie burn, um, a fear of bulking up. I hear that all the time. So our fitness culture right now really preaches a lot of harder, the better, the sweatier, the better. And these beatdown style workouts don't yield results in the long term. They result in burnout. They result in plateaus, sometimes injuries, because they're lacking the foundation of building true functional strength. So don't get me wrong. The classes at the lift lab are hard. We get sweaty. Uh, muscles are burning, but they're not hard in a trendy way. We make the programming smart about how we work out. And it's about building our body up and not breaking it down. In the 12 years of experience I've had working one-on-one -on -one with clients and in a group setting, I know for a fact that it's not the more the better. Um, it's not one more rep and one more rep and one more rep. It's not more sweat. Uh, balance, smart workouts, strength training, well-rounded programs are the key to success. That might not sound as sexy as some of the other things, but it's the reality of what is going to get you the results you're looking for. So at the Lift Lab, I combine a simple yet effective weight training program Nothing too fancy, but it works with a side of metabolic conditioning to give the people the results that they're, they're looking for. It will, plus, it will address muscle imbalances and prevent in injury. So this type of training just a few days a week can really yield significant results. And especially for women, I hope that the Lift Lab can show them that lifting weights, especially heavier ones, will help them sculpt the body that they're actually looking for. Weightlifting does not make you big and bulky overnight. And at the end of the day, muscle is sexy. Um, hello, music to my ears. I like really can't wait to get her on the podcast. That was just everything. <laughs> and here is the second response to my question. So my favorite exercise at the lift lab is hard to choose, but I will say the squat. And the reason why is because the squat has so many different variations that allow you to constantly challenge your body without getting bored and with keeping some variety in your routine. So we have the back squat, we have the front squat, we have a box squat, a goblet squat, a jumping squat, a body weight squat, so many different squats. And adding all those into your program is a great way to have functional fitness in your workout routine. All of us need to be able to sit down and stand up multiple times a day. And we should be able to do that with good form without any assistance, especially as we continue to age and so the squat is going to make us functionally strong. And again, like I said, with the different types of variations, you can continue to have the squat as a regular part of your fitness program without getting bored. So, yeah, I agree with that <laughs> on so many levels because the squat is also my favorite exercise. But I also just see so much potential for us to build a lot of strength and functionality and mobility in our body when we train for the squat, which is why it has been in my program for three years, why I continue to come back to that, why I continue to tweak it and measure it and focus on it. So really, that is what the um, the essence of this episode is, is to show you all the the aspects of building muscle so that and looking good and feeling good and moving well <laughs> so that brings us to this last segment of this exercise where I sit down with Ryan for a and a on building the muscles and getting the booty 
Um, Like I said, this is dedicated to all the ladies who have come up to me and complimented me on my ass. I love you all. But the truth is, I don't have a short answer for you. We are 50 minutes into this podcast and I am not even close to done here. I even already thought of another podcast episode to do with this stuff to like explain what the big lifts are, hip thrust deadlifts, squats, and me and Ryan will get into that um, or he gets into it. I keep asking questions. So yeah, stay tuned and keep in mind how how much this process is a long-term process. Do not fall prey to people that promise you massive changes in two months. It just, just don't do it. No, 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 no on the list of (laughs) no-nos. Anyways, all right. So here's that second or last part of this episode. Enjoy. Okay. Um, So when I brought up today's subject of talking about lower body composition, specifically for women, and helping people answer this question of how do I get that shape? How do I get that physique? Um, what came to mind when I asked you, when I told you about this? Uh, that's basically the only way to get a woman in the gym, basically, is kind of what I come across. <laughs> like that's the only fucking thing they care about is having a bigger ass, which I'm not really against. I enjoy a nice <laughs> ass. But like at the same time, I think, uh, I think there should be more to it than just that. Like aesthetics are great, but functionality is going to be what is going to get you through life. Mm-hmm. I mean, if I personally think that like, if all you're doing is hip thrust for the next 20 years, you're going to have some type of low back issue. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm sure there's going to be like an epidemic problem. Like chiropractors are going to get rich in 20 years because of what's going on now. Yeah. The orthopedic surgeons right now and the, like the PRP market, they're benefiting from the amount of CrossFit that women were doing right now. Like <laughs> The, the hips, um, the hips have been, uh, beat up in CrossFit. Um, I, and on a, on a statistical significant level too, not just like me and my observations, like the amount of hip surgeries in women has increased a lot in the last few handful of years. And I think oh, it's because of CrossFit. Um, probably. <laughs> yeah. I, so what I've been going off of to help women understand the importance of getting in the gym is I've been talking about bone health and studying it a lot. I learned from a very, from a very interesting source that we start, women start losing their bone density as early as 25, probably because of so that's where I started. And that was a couple of years ago. So ever since then, I've been kind of, th- I've been thinking, all right, how do I help women see the importance of getting in the gym besides the ass building component? <laughs> and that was it. That's the only thing I could come up with that really. Did um, it. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't know. I mean, personally, I don't want a woman who's weak. Like yeah. my, my, my baseline for like what I want out of a mate is like, if you can't do a pull up, like, I don't really want to be with you at all. <laughs> okay. I would, I, I would ideally like you to have a nice ass, but like I yeah. can always build an ass later. Yes. Like, <laughs> so let's talk about that. Okay. Yeah. So, um, my, all right. So yeah, I was just commenting on from a, like a marketing perspective and, about the bone stuff. So the other thing that is constant in my life is that I have genetically been gifted with a wonderful butt and it it is, <laughs> and it's been very, it, it's genetic. Like there's no, you can't argue this. If you meet my cousins, it, you know, my mother, my aunt, it's all, it's very obvious in plain sight that it's genetic. Okay. And then I grew up as, um, you know, as a very fast athlete. So then I grew, you know, I, I, I developed into a very strong person. My legs are very (laughs) heavy and that's from all the work that I did as an athlete. Um, and 
I started lifting weights when I was 16. So, yeah. So I am personally. And you're not um, huge, right? You're not like a fucking gorilla. No, not at all. Funny, funny how that works, right? <laughs> like you don't, you don't just turn into a gorilla when if you pick up a weight. <sighs> yeah, no, that's true. Um, yeah. And like some women do believe that I have a theory on that as well. <laughs> and the other thing is that I'm personally tired of answering that question with a bland. I'm sorry, ladies, I have no answer for you outside of it is genetic. And I know that there's more to the story. I'm a rehab professional, neuromuscular therapist. I don't know how to build booties, even though I have one. And that's the, that, that's basically the bottom line. And that's why you're here because you have experience with body composition changes, physique changes. Can you tell me a little bit about that background and um, maybe a, 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 a story of something good that happened as a result of trying to put on muscle with a woman? Um, all right. My background is basically in strength and conditioning. Um, and I mean, in any sport, you're going to have to put on muscle. Um, and I, I think women, as far as like the women I've worked with have all basically been in MMA, um, who were not necessarily trying to grow a big butt, but, Mm -hmm. uh, at the same time they needed to put on muscle, fast, explosive muscle. Uh, and I mean, I had one girl who she, I guess she was genetically blessed, kind of like you, she already had a big butt. Um, but we did squats and it grew even bigger. Uh, squats and then like we did short sprints just for like intervals um, and her butt grew even bigger, which I mean, I was happy with that, but I mean, I don't, the, the goal isn't really, uh, the goal is, wasn't body transformation at that point. It was just sports performance. But if you look at any sprinter, I mean, go look at the hundred meters in the Olympics and just stand behind the starting line. <laughs> it's just one giant ass after the other. If, if I could be so lucky. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. But I mean, the, and then there's some, like, I think, um, I guess the research points to like fast twitch, slow twitch muscle fibers. There's the, the glutes are comprised of both, but I mean, if you look at sprinters, I mean, obviously they're working hard for a very short amount of time. And they grow so much bigger versus mm-hmm. like if you try to do thousand reps or thousand steps, you're not really going to grow anything. Um, mm-hmm. So I, I try to transition everybody to lift heavier. Most mm-hmm. women kind of shy away from that because they're scared of getting too big. But I think the one way into that is that no woman wants a smaller butt. So like lift as heavy as you can, mm-hmm. at least in that exercise. And you'll see how hard it is to grow. Mm-hmm. And then you won't be able to grow by doing other exercises. Um, yeah. So you won't walk out of the gym like a gorilla. You'll be toned like you would want to see on the front of a magazine. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, when were you introduced to um, helping people change their body composition and measuring like skin folds? About five years ago, okay. Um, I did the bioprint or biosignature from Charles Pollock, and um, he just went through various uh, different sites on your body to measure skin folds, and each site correlates with a different, uh, basically, metabolic process or hormone within the body. Um, it. And it seems to work pretty well. I mean, I've had people come back with blood tests and I've said like, oh, your DHA is high, is low. Mm-hmm. And then it, it correlated with the, the skin fold. Mm-hmm. So it, it, it's very interesting. It works. Um, but yeah, about five years ago, that's mm-hmm. what I, when I kind of got into it. Yeah. It's, I, I think it is so, I, you know, it was very enlightening and insightful for me to learn that as a person who went through the coaching of a biosignature practitioner. And 
I thought that there was a lot more to spot reduction than people get like than the thought that we just say, oh, you can't spot reduce. And right. there was just like a lot more to it. And meaning like, we're going to work on your overall growth and metabolic pathways, but we're going to come back to this measurement at the hamstring fold, a gluteal fold and right. see if it changes. And yeah. There's just like so much more involved than I ever thought, to be <laughs> honest with you. Like, and it, it was, I thought the most interesting part of the plan to get rid of hamstring fat or get rid of it or metabolize it, whatever uh, is the correct term, um, to change that fat ratio at the hamstrings and the glutes, I was surprised at how much emphasis there was on poop and fiber. <laughs> well, I mean, the, the hamstring site is basically where you store xenoestrogens or uh -huh. environmental toxins or, or stuff like that. So what, what is that? That is basically like for women, women put on something like 120 different perfumes or lotions, shampoos, Whoa. I mean, all that kind of stuff a day. So all those toxic chemicals, if they can't be uh, detoxified or excreted out of the body, store inside your body and they store in fat cells. And it just so happens that they store mostly in your hamstring. Mm -hmm. um, the reason fiber, it just kind of helps to cleave all that stuff and kind of get it out of your body faster. Um, but outside of that, I would say that for most women, they would do they would benefit themselves to try to cut down the toxic burden that they're exposing themselves to every day. Mm -hmm. um, and the easiest way to do that is just look at all the, the ingredients in the stuff that you put in on or around your body. Mm -hmm. If you can't pronounce it, it's a chemical and that chemical mm -hmm. is having some type of uh, reaction to you, whether you think about it or not. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason that's allowed to happen is that you say you, I don't know. It, it takes years to manifest within your body. Like it doesn't just happen overnight. Like if you look, if you put, I don't know, acid on your skin, it's going to burn automatically. But if you put, I don't know, phthalates on your body for 30 years, it, it takes that long before anything really happens. So yeah, the, gross. the less, yeah, the less burden you can put on your body, the less, the healthier you're going to be, the less fat you're going to be. Yeah. The easier you could lose weight. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so that always back to the basics, lots of water, <laughs> fiber <laughs> and minimal, yeah, minimal toxic load. And yeah, I changed all of my skincare products a dec easily a decade ago to be completely on the environmental, um, right. EWG. Yeah. That, yeah. EWG, Environmental working group. Yeah. It's to either comply with that or come super close to it. I definitely think the skin is, it's just, so, it's, it, it's just only a couple millimeters. It's only four millimeters deep. If that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like people think you, it's this like hard barrier and it's just not it's right. If you won't eat it, then you probably shouldn't put it on your skin. Cause it all kind of goes to the same place. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. People don't realize that. And so I guess the most tangible thing is like, I, I always have, when I have this conversation with people, I always start with the deodorant because they're putting that deodorant stick like so close to a very dense area of lymph nodes. And yeah, most, yeah. if it's, if it's antiperspirant, it generally has aluminum in it. Oof. And I mean, like who wants to put metal and let it absorb into your skin, right? <laughs> a lot of people do. <laughs> I, yeah. I mean, because even if you tell them it's aluminum, there's metal in there. They look at you cross-eyed and they're like, well, I don't want to stink. Well, th then the next question is, why do you stink? Yeah. <laughs> stop, eating, stop eating like shit. Yeah. Basically. Yeah. But then that, that kind of leads down a different road. I yeah. Mean, like, yeah. 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 <laughs> um, 
But so if someone comes and says, I want to build glutes, I want toned hamstrings or legs. What, I mean, I know my role as a neuromuscular therapist is to give them exercises that are going to decrease the, the load on their lower back or like exercises that can help keep the hips and the pelvis balanced and the knees functional so that yeah. they can do a bunch of lifting. So yeah. you basically give them the structural work so that they can do the, I don't know, the primary work to build the, the functional work. Yeah. yeah. So functional yeah. Work. Yeah. I would call like the, the, you know, so when we talk about strength and conditioning, I think of, you know, schemes and planning. So schemes, meaning like how many reps you're doing for how many sets and what is the tempo, right? Right. Okay. So then that I'm trying to set people up for success what, for whatever their program is. And yeah, so I'm trying to give them some structural um, stability work and then so that they can do the functional work of a lot of bending and thrusting. Yeah. Without destroying their body even more. Right. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. So what, what's the, what's the, what are, what are the first conversations that you have with people when they, when that is their goal? I mean, I think anything needs to start with diet. I mean, if you're not willing to change a the diet, then it's going to be very hard for you to build muscle. Mm -hmm. it be very hard for you to have a shapely bottom if it's just masked with layers and layers of excess fat, right? Mm -hmm. um, and if you're that big, you're probably, again, it comes back to being toxic and have a whole toxic burden. So all that is the first conversation. Mm -hmm. um, after that, then we can go talk about or go to the gym floor and work on exercises. But the, the, the one thing about it is there's not one variable that is you can do and it's just magically going to get you what you want. Adding everything in or different pieces, pulling them together will give you the best result. I think that's maybe overlooked with most people. They think they can just go to the gym and then do a thousand hip thrusts and they're going to have a, a giant ass. Yeah. I mean, it'll, it'll grow, but it's not going to grow as well as it would be if you did all the other components, right? So uns it's, you're, you're saying there's a way to get unsustainable growth and um, then, and then people get like, learn their lesson the hard way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that's everybody, right? We, yeah. we all, we all go walk a certain path until it stops working. Oh. Oh, <laughs> and then we're like, Oh, this doesn't work. So let me try something else. But well, yeah, that would be a downstream way of, yeah, no, I, I, I want people to move into like an upstream way of thinking about their strength training, their fitness overall, and right. be able to strategize around the things that they want. So like, th you know, thinking that the path, like you're just going to walk on this path until it stops doesn't really fit into that model, you know? Okay. Uh, well, I don't, yeah. I mean, that's my opinion. I don't deal with people and their body composition goals as much as you do though. Right. So, yeah. I, and I'm, I'm super strict. Like if you're not going to eat right, then get out of my face. Mm. That's number one. Um, yeah. but once you get all that out of the way, once you get, food and if you want to change your environment your lifestyle then we can talk about the gym um or not even the gym i think most people don't even have access to a gym now at least in california you can't go or la you can't go mm -hmm. um, they kicked everybody out again mm -hmm. um so i mean there's things you can do at home i mean everybody has a floor they can lay on mm -hmm. they can definitely do hip thrusts mm -hmm. or not hip thrusts um bridges mm -hmm. bridges you're just laying on your back uh, your knees are bent you're pushing through your heels and you're driving your pelvis towards the ceiling. Yeah. Um, and the, that's basically something everybody can do. Mm -hmm. And the one thing I think most people miss with, with any exercise is that whatever the primary muscle they're trying to work, if it's not burning, then there, what, it, then you really need to focus harder on working that muscle. Mm -hmm. Um, now, if you're laying on the ground and you're doing a, a, a bridge, 
you're going to have the most tension on your ass at the highest point of the movement. So like, if you're not feeling your butt, then there's probably some, something you're either, you're not thinking about working the muscle or you're feeling some other muscle working harder. Mm -hmm. That could be, um, your, your feet are too far forward. So you're feeling your hamstrings. So then you'd pull your feet closer to your butt and you should be able to activate more of your glutes that way. Um, but it, it's really about intent. I think at a certain point, you're right. Like that's a very overlooked factor. <laughs> um, and you know, if you actually think about the muscle that you're going to work beforehand, it does increase the metabolic activity and the neural activity, motor activity, the motor control activity, um, in, in the right environment, right? Like it can't, <laughs> it can't be too much, you know, and it has to be, um, the right amount that your body can struggle a little bit through, but not too much. And right. so I guess the, uh, so I is think it, like that is a big factor that is overlooked. That's basically what I was trying to put a pin in there. It's a huge factor. And yeah, so, but then, you know, and then there are muscle activation issues beyond like just not thinking about it, but man, does that solve a lot of problems for people is just giving them some anatomy lessons and telling them, yeah, yeah this is how we would set you up if you, we were doing like uh, phys any type of physique training it's, you know, it's well practiced in the bodybuilding and right. practice that you should, you know, you have to focus on this internally to get more out of the muscle. And that might not work if you're a baseball player and you're like, okay, let me activate my glutes before I swing. Like that doesn't, it doesn't work that way, <laughs> but <laughs> right. people think it does, you know, you laugh, but I mean, <laughs> I, I go back and forth on this stuff all the time with, um, <laughs> coaches and trainers. And, uh, I, yeah, so I think that's important to, well, everything, nothing works in isolation, like no muscle. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think that's the one concept that everybody should understand. I mean, if you're swinging a bat, you're still using your ass to stabilize. Oh, that's hips. an ass so that's, sport. Yeah. So, it's so a lot of hip extension. <laughs> But like, if you're just focusing on squeezing your ass to try to swing a bat, it doesn't work like that. It's oh, it, it doesn't. It, <laughs> it does. It does the app opposite. It hurts you. Yeah, because, yeah. <laughs> because you need to be. Uh, you need that. That um, your brain needs to be calculating what that hundred mile an hour ball coming at you. Right. Not the um, the three muscles that you think you can activate. The tension in your in yeah. your glutes. <laughs> yeah. So if, you know, on the surface level, like what we just said, looks like it contradicts each other, but it doesn't. And there's a lot of gray area in between there. And I just think it is a, and that's something you can build into like a warm up is, you know, the, the internal focus, what you're about to work on and like priming your brain and your muscle system at the same time to say, okay, here right. we go. Here we go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think that's what, I guess for you, that's kind of what you would te help teach people with so that they, when they go and lift weights, that they know how to activate that mm -hmm. so that they can get the result that they want out of the strength training exercise. Yeah. So if we're talking about someone doing hip thrust and, uh, and I have a question about that. So I need to come back to that hip thrust. Um, so if we're talking about something like a hip thrust and getting like the most out of, uh, controlling your body and getting the most out of the load that you're providing, whether that be a band or an actual barbell, right. um, is you want to set yourself up for activation before you get there. And then when you do, when you're doing the hip thrust motion, you're thinking about pushing that weight and catching that weight and being eccentric and controlling your body right. versus like two muscles again. Like, so, <laughs> uh, you know, separating the two is actually one of the strategies I use with the hundreds of people that have told me my glutes aren't activated. 
And <laughs> I'm like, you're right. Like just doing a hip bridge alone at a really shitty tempo, like uncontrolled. Yeah. If you're just not, bouncing gonna, back yeah. and forth, you're not, you're not, you're probably just using your quads at that point. Yeah. Yeah. No wonder. No Dorsey wonder flexors. Forget. Yeah. <laughs> Getting those anterior tib working yeah. real good. And uh, then there's um, the fact that on the other side of this, like glute activation and into like that booty building conversation is doing a thousand reps with a mini band is not sufficient for the goals that we're talking about in my assumption. Am I correct? Or in your opinion? Um, I, I think there's, again, it comes back to, like you said earlier, genetic variability, right? Like mm -hmm. certain people can do a thousand reps and get more growth out. And then other people, if they did a thousand reps, like if I did a thousand reps, I would die. I would atrophy. I'm, I'm much better doing between, uh, I don't know, six to eight heavy as mm. I can go versus 20 to 30 reps. Mm. Um, and I think the only people, only way people can really figure that out is to try various techniques in the gym and see what works better for them. Now mm -hmm. I think different exercises work better where or with different tempos. I mean, uh, it's going to be super easy to load you up with a lot of weight for a hip thrust. Um, but if you're doing uh, those, those banded walks, like three steps, you're not going to get anything out of it. Right. Mm -hmm. So different exercises work differently for different, uh, people. Mm -hmm. Um, same thing with rep ranges. Um, mm -hmm. the best way to, I guess, figure that out is try different ones. Um, yeah. see if your, your pants stop fitting. Right. <laughs> So, um, that was my next question, like a rep scheme on a hip thrust. Uh, so if, so if, so the rep scheme I've only, I had, I do not have a, a, almost any experience with using hip thrust for myself. Okay. I did it in one program, uh, in 2018 in in a squat program and I, I, I didn't like the sensation of the barbell. Yeah. <laughs> I, and we had one of those, um, machines Pez. that was set oh. up for, uh, hip thrust. It wasn't the, the Nautilus thing, but okay. it looked like a, you know, it, it just had a, a, a small bench for your shoulders. It was and just then a hip thrust bench. It was a hip thrust bench. Yeah. Okay. So I don't have a lot of experience with that, but I'm seeing it as something I'm going to start using because of my lack of equipment with the gym. Right. So what do you think is a good rep scheme to start with? If you uh, want to build muscle. Six to eight, probably. Six to eight. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's functional hypertrophy. I mean, mm -hmm. do a couple sets with that and then four, three to four sets of that. And then you could do a last set where you drop the weight a little bit and then drop the weight to like 50% and then do as many as you can control for your last set. Mm. That's called drop set. Uh, not a drop set. It's just, okay. you're just burning out on the, on the last, uh, on the last rep or last cry, set. Cry set. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You'll probably be crying by the time you're done with that. <laughs> um, Okay. Got it. And then, and then one tip for like, if you're doing hip extension is if you posteriorly tilt your pelvis, you get a little bit more glute activation at the top. Oh yeah, you do. Yeah. So yeah. Even, so if you're doing hip thrust or if you're doing bridges, that would be the one tip to get more out of your, your butt. Yeah. I actually have people start the motion with their tilt. Okay. And then, um, yeah, because I, Again, like the populations I'm working with have already been told their glutes don't work. It's because they sit all day long. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, oof. It's a very good conversation to have at some well, point. I guess that's one, that's one thing we should mention, right? Like, so yeah. if you're sitting, your glutes are stretched all day long, right? Mm. So if you get up, they're just like, like uh, old rubber bands, right? They just, yeah. Fall. Like, um, oh, I'm thinking of, um, Squidward on, uh, SpongeBob. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
So where I also wanted to take this conversation is to the he's talking about eccentrics okay. and why they might be of particular interest for this like group trying to grow their glutes. Um, I, I would be careful for novices to do eccentric work. Mm-hmm. I mean, cause they have no awareness of how to use their body. Mm-hmm. So if, I mean, generally when you do eccentrics, you're, you're, you're stronger on the eccentric contraction, right? So say you're doing a squat, you, you can probably, and you can only squat a hundred pounds, right? But you could probably control 200 pounds all the way down. I would never put more weight on for somebody to do an eccentric work. But that's how I think about it. Mm-hmm. Now, if you're, t- if you are talking about just controlling the eccentric contraction, regardless of the weight, then yes, I agree with you. I think we all need to control all of our exercises to elicit the response we're looking for. Like if Mm -hmm. you're just bouncing up and down, you're not really working. You're just bouncing up and down. Yeah. I mean, you're wasting your time. Yeah. 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 Um, But yeah, if you control and think about the exercise and you yeah, you control the eccentric, so the negative motion of the exercise. Sit at the bottom for one second and then come back up. Mm-hmm. Then uh, I think you're, you'll get, you'll definitely get more out of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, there, one, there's never going to be anything wrong with more control in your exercise, and two, if I, I, I think. Oh, where was I going with that? Yeah, the the, like differentiating the different types of eccentrics. Yeah, there's one type that is going to elicit a lot of quote unquote damage and therefore potential growth. Right. And then there's the other kind that could be a primary goal, which is learning your full range and learning how to control that full range of motion, whatever exercise it could be. Yeah, I would start with the latter first. Like, I think everybody should learn how to control their full range. Mm -hmm. And then they can start to overload, say, and eccentrically. Um, Because you don't want, again, it comes back to, like, knowing how your body works. Um, If you, say, the first time you step on a platform to do a squat and you have no idea and you, I don't know, put on a whole bunch of weight, you're going to either hurt yourself or fall over or something. Because you're not your your body isn't aware of what it should be doing, um, and that's that's the other reason I think, or that's one reason why you should have a good coach mm-hmm. there, if, so they can t- teach you where you should feel something, what you might not be doing correctly. Because I mean, I go when when I did when I was able to go to the gym, I'd always I, I was one wear blindfolds because it's just like everybody has no fucking clue what they're doing. Like their knees are collapsing. They're using their back to squat. Like what, what, what is going on? I, I, yeah. Yeah. And I, I'm doing this podcast. I'm hosting it. And then like, I'm just making the assumption that everybody understands that <laughs> investing in training and coaching and programming is so worth it. Like, it's just, it, I'm, I couldn't imagine doing something for two years and then learning it was a waste of time when I was trying to be healthy, you know, I do it in other areas of my life. um, (laughs) That's at every level though. I mean, you look at even professional athletes, they make in 10 million a year. They won't spend 20 grand on training Mm. to have a a 10 year career. Instead they, they fall off after two or three, like what, what the hell is wrong with you? If everybody thinks they know what they're doing until they don't. Right. Yeah. 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 No. Yeah. And you can see that I live in a very in a idealistic <laughs> place. Yeah. I mean, I, but I, I do, I live in, I, I, my mind is always to the ideal. And I started this podcast to essentially be, be able to tell these stories of how fascinating it is to learn while you're improving your body. Right. And I think that is the most beautiful thing ever. So that's why I have this <laughs> podcast. And, you know, so if, if if I'm speaking to that person that is on the fence as to 
how they're going to improve their body, where they're going to spend their money. And I, I mean, guess there's what no, the there's next no step better is. investment, right? There's no yeah. better investment than your health, right? So you either spend the money now or you spend it 40 years from now on the medications or pills or surgeries you need just so you can go and live in your nursing home because you can't move. Right. Mm. Yeah. That's kind of the way I look at it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't even go that far in my head with it. You know, I look oh. at it as like, <laughs> as I look at it as like what, you know, finding out what could be possible, you know, finding out what, if, if, if optimal isn't even a goal, you know, you just keep going and, and right. you know, there's just no, there, there's no level of it's health the, that I'm stopping at. It's the growth mindset is just yeah. applied physically. Right. I mean, that's, I, I, I think I have it. I, I never want to stop learning. I, I love this. I, mm -hmm. I, I get hyped up when I learn something new, like when other people watch sports or something and they're like, Oh, that was great. And I, I do that when I read, <laughs> like I jump up, I'm like, Oh, this is fucking awesome. <laughs> but, yeah. but yeah, I don't, I don't think, I don't know if you can teach that to somebody, like if they don't have it, then it's, it's very hard for them to get it unless something I guess in their life changes or they have a serious uh, event that makes them realize that, Oh, I'm not living optimally and maybe I need to change something. Mm. I thought personally, I thought that this whole coronavirus would open people's eyes to how uh, we're not living as healthy as we could. Right. But no, it, 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 nothing happened. Mm -hmm. um, and it, if you're, if your your main goal is to grow your butt, I mean, there's different exercises to, to, do to grow your butt i mean they have glute dominant exercise they have quad dominant exercises and then they have like hamstring dominant exercises um and i would i would say to, to work with a coach but i i know most people aren't going to because mm -hmm. one they probably don't have access two it's kind of expensive but mm -hmm. again is an investment in your health right mm -hmm. it's better for you to take i don't know six weeks of training invest money in six weeks of training to figure out how to do it correctly. Mm -hmm. And then you can kind of go off on your own. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, so yeah, like the, there is a practicality of this, honestly, because you work on your form for the first, you know, six weeks to three months, basically, depending on how new right. or how screwed up you are. Cause like having this conversation with a, a fem a, a previous female athlete that had ACL reconstruction you know, we're talking, you have to do a lot of single work, leg work. You have to do, you know, you have to even things out and make sure that they have a, a, an acceptable variation in their single leg squat. Right. And then. Yeah. yeah if you have like ACL issues, that could be, that could stem from like a, what a glute medius, like a weakness. Right. So that's gonna, oh, big time. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, that comes back to like strengthening your ass. <laughs> yeah, I know. So that, yeah. So you'll, you'll look better and you'll perform better at the yep. same time. Yep. And then, so then after that, we have potentially a trainer relationship where you know that the, you know, the dominant moves that you're doing, you know how to do them well, well enough to build upon anyways. Right. And then after that, you could seriously work with this person on a programming level and a couple like video consults to check, make sure that they're doing things with the right time. Right. And then you're moving on to like a successful year essentially, because I mean yeah. that, you know, like doing less than investing your time and money and focusing for weeks, uh, several weeks could set you up for a whole entire year of progress and then a whole entire next year of progress. And then, you know, maybe you're onto something new, but in my head, like if you're, if we're having this conversation with someone, I, I mean, I think they should be invested for like two years at least to really see growth. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it takes a long time to build muscle. <laughs> I mean, you yeah. can, you'll definitely be able to gain strength. I mean, I think most strength, 
in the first like six months just comes from learning how to use the movement, but that does, that's not necessarily going to allow you to put on muscle. And then muscle is going to be dependent on your food and your protein intake. And if you're a game changer and you're, hmm. you're all vegan, it's going to be way harder to put on muscle. So that's a whole nother fucking story. <laughs> but, oh uh, yeah. But yeah, it, it's going to take time. Um, so like for our for recommendation, I mean, I would say find a coach, learn how to do the movement, and then you can uh, find a better coach to just use to purchase a program from them. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, and then they could even do Skype sessions with you because you already know how to do the movement. You don't necessarily need a coach there to like poke you in the right place to say this muscle should be working. You you already know it's working. Mm-hmm. So at that point, you're just working with different rep schemes and protocols mm-hmm. um, that would allow you to have a variability to continuously adapt and grow. Yeah. Um, and then what if you could so and so let's say this person is invested for a year. How often are they doing strength work to focus on the lower, you know, the hip dominant exercises? Um, I'll say twice, maybe three times a week. I mean, mm-hmm. depending on the schedule, depending on the recovery, like if, if you're doing, doing it twice a week and we don't see your numbers move or anything like that, then maybe you're not re- being able to recover. So we have to maybe take a step back, do it once a week and then reduce the stress in your life. Um, but then you got other people on the other end that they can do it twice a week, three times a week, and they completely recover and they can come back and hit it harder the next week. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it, it also comes down to like, there's different rep schemes. So like if you're doing a lighter cycle, then I mean, you could, probably do that three times a week whereas if you're doing a heavier cycle you'd want to do that less Mm -hmm. Um, generally intensity is tied to uh, recovery so the higher the intensity intensity meaning weight Mm -hmm. the higher the weight you're using the longer you're going to want to recover or need to recover so that you can come back next time and and do more and grow so for example a power lifter if they were doing a three rep scheme they would need five days to recover. Oh, if you look at Ed Cohn, Ed Cohn's like the granddaddy OG of deadlifting, right? Mm -hmm. He would, he would only deadlift once every 10 days. I mean, granted he was doing like a thousand pounds, right? Mm -hmm. If you pull that much, I guess you can get 10 days off, but Mm -hmm. for everybody else, I mean, once a week might be enough. Mm -hmm. If you're completely novice, like you just fresh off the boat and you just want to jump into the gym, yeah, you could probably do it once every five days. Um, mm-hmm. But again, it comes down to, are you recovering? And that's completely individual. There's no like, there's no formula that says this is going to work for everybody. Um, it, it's just, that's, that's why it's important to write down your workouts. So say you did, you pulled a hundred pound deadlift on, on Monday, you want to wait five days. So you go back Friday and and you can't even get a hundred pounds. You go, you can only do 90. Okay. Well, you obviously need longer to recover. Um, whereas somebody on the other end of the spectrum, they pull a hundred on Monday, get to Friday, they're at 105. Okay. Well, they recovered. So they wait another five days and they go up again. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So basically I, I, I think it's important to say like being able to have confidence to walk in and kind of test where you're at range wise. Right. is not something that you can just, it, that takes a, a level of discomfort that, um, and, and, and you're walking into it with a lack of confidence. That's another place where a trainer can really help, like picking out that weight and knowing when, like with, when I worked with Evan, he, he and I would go back and forth on technical and mechanical failure. Right. And like, for me, judging that weight, I was always off and I'm, something, <laughs> I'm serious. I am. I, I, I was off. I, I was under, I was underestimating. Yeah. That's a skill. Like it, I, I, I learned that the longer I've been doing this, the better I am at guessing the weight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Do you have any other comments on that? Because I think that's kind of curious and an and overlooked factor of, of hiring a trainer. As far as like uh, what? The strength and conditioning piece. And like, you know, it, when we're talking about rep schemes and strength and conditioning and picking out um, the picking out the right load, like. Um, it, you should be able to control the load through through the rep scheme, right? So say you're doing three sets of 10, you should be able to control that weight for 10 reps for each set. Now, obviously there might be some drop off on the third set, second or third set. But if you're doing 10 reps and you can, and you get to the 10th one and you have five more, that's too light, obviously. Mm -hmm. Or if you only get, if it's your first set and you're trying to do 10 reps and you only get six, obviously that's too heavy. Mm -hmm. So if it's too heavy, then you go a little bit lighter, still control the weight. If it's too light, you go a little bit heavier. I mean, that's, and that's, I mean, I think that's pretty much common sense, but mm -hmm. maybe not for most people. I, I mean, know. it's not I, I, because it's wrapped up in, it can be wrapped up in anxiety a little bit too. Cause you don't know where you're going. You don't know if you're yeah. like, okay, I'm going into this and I'm not sure where I'm going to land today. Right. And I think a like, lot of people worry about um, just like, oh, I'm, I'm so weak. I, I need to do more weight. No, you need to learn how to control the weight and then you can get stronger because you'll, you'll have just like, don't, you shouldn't be ego lifting. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. you shouldn't go to the gym and slap one six wheels on either side of the, the bar and think you can do it. No, you should try 135 first or, or pick a weight that's manageable so that you can actually feel the muscles work that you want to work. That's going to, that's going to be way more beneficial than going as heavy as you can, mm -hmm. especially if you want to build anything. Speaking of glutes, like if you're just, if you put on, I don't know, as much as you can on a, on a barbell and try to do a barbell thrust and you're just bouncing back and forth, but you don't feel your butt working. What do you, what, what is, what do you really think you're going to get out of that? Nothing. But if you do half as much weight, control the tempo down, control it up and your ass is burning on the third rep. Okay. Well, you're going to get way more out of that. Yeah, no. Um, yeah. So I guess I, where I was is that I didn't realize that there was a place between ego lifting and doing not enough, you know, <laughs> like, and that's what I was walking in with. Right. Okay. So, so, uh, Evan had to, tell me for months how to go to mechanical failure or to technical failure, you know, where yeah. the last two reps aren't pretty. Right. If you yeah. want to speak. And so, because like I, you know, I'm a, a, a disclaimer audience. This podcast always comes back down to how much I love strength training and <laughs> what, what I've been through. Um, so, you know, um, I guess, uh, my experience was of a, a person that had to learn how to push themselves after recovering from sports injuries. And right. so there's this big area that I didn't know existed, which was lifting for health. It was lifting for sport, which is kind of fun and kind of, and, and kind of <laughs> humbling. Right. And then there's, uh, yoga. Right. And, <laughs> and there wasn't much in there between. So I had to learn a lot about what it felt like to push myself in a comfortable, but on like in the right zone of discomfort. There's a difference between comfort zone and, and safe zone. So mm -hmm. The yeah. comfort zone is is usually on the couch, right? You can go to the gym, so you're out of your safe zone, and then you put a little bit more weight. You put like one percent more on. That's still in your safe zone, but it's not your comfort zone. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that so it's was just something... slightly slight step out of that. Yeah, yeah. So that was something I had to learn. Um, and when and it all, I also had to learn that a level of finesse with lifting that I didn't really know existed as well, you know? Um, and then I also had to battle with the, the personal trainer 
slash rehab professional that is trained to be so critical. <laughs> right. And then like yeah. how, how, how to ease, how to make it work for me and not be too yeah. critical of like, I don't, my form does not have to be absolutely perfect every single time. And, and well, I, I have to get over that because it's not, it's not realistic. <laughs> yeah. I, I think it's a battle of ego at a certain point. Right. I mean, you have, a lot of education behind you and then you have somebody else with a different perspective which might not agree with your perspective that doesn't necessarily either one of you is wrong but i think you kind of clash heads uh at at first until mm -hmm. you kind of realize that oh maybe maybe i can try this and it will work better yes and i think that's I, with everybody right yeah i mean i was very protective of my opinion and my ego correct yeah <laughs> and when Evan was telling me, no, you need to go to a little bit of failure on these guys on this set. I, I, you know, I struggled with that internally a lot, like a lot, like, <laughs> like I would not text it. I would just like, I would have to put down the phone kind of upset. Like, how dare he, <laughs> he doesn't know. <laughs> but Evan and I have like such a great working relationship. So, um, <laughs> and then Okay, so then, wow. Wow, 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 you guys. Thank you so much for making it this far. If you are one of those people who are still hanging out, please hit me up on social. Think fit, be fit underscore podcast on Instagram or Jen Impact on Twitter and tell me what you loved about this episode. And I want to send you some swag. I want to send you a Think Fit, Be Fit podcast water bottle, BPA free. And it's got a little sippy straw so you can enjoy it while you're working out without spilling it all over yourself because I love you that much. And I love you because you are here with a self-improvement mindset and it is underrated and underappreciated. So thank you. Thank you for being in your power and stepping up to being your healthiest and your best. This podcast episode took like seven hours of my time to produce and record. So please leave us a review to let people know that you're learning on iTunes or Spotify and send it to your friends. Our social media is so sexy and so exciting because I want you guys to share it. So go for it and hang out with us um, on the lives that we're doing every two Fridays a month. So in order to know when that's happening, you have to be on my Instagram or the newsletter at thinkfitbefitpodcast.com. Thank you so much for being here and truly love you guys and have a great week.